attention. So finally people caught on. They said, you know what, let's follow the Prophet <laughs> It's tough because when you get used to doing something, to change it is very difficult, particularly in religious things. Because you think, khalas, this is my safety zone. If there's anything we should learn from Islam, is that growth is a continual process until we enter the grave. And there's always something new to learn, and there's always something to fix. And that's going to be what we'll talk about. We ready? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Today we're talking about the conclusion to the Holy Qur'an. Any book, any literary work has an introduction and it has a conclusion. The introduction's purpose is to give you all you need to know about the purpose of this book. What's this book about? What is its intended goals and aims and the information that you should gain out of it? The conclusion sums up the takeaway. What do you take away What's the most important thing you take away from this book? So the introduction is Surah Al-Fatiha. Yeah? And so that's basically defining the spiritual journey. It's very simple. You recognize that you are surrounded. وَسِعَ رَبِّي كُلَّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا وَسِعَتْ رَحْمَتُهُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ His mercy, compassion, His beneficence, all of that surrounds everything that exists, right? So once you recognize that all of this around me came from one source, then you realize that that is the ma'bud al-haq. That is the one that should be worshipped alone. And the way we call that in Arabic is Allah. So right, Bismillah, when you say Bismillah, in honor and remembrance of all of His qualities and His presence in our lives, Primarily being Rahmah, right? <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Then the lifestyle begins by praising Him, being grateful to Him. Rabbil Alameen, knowing that He is taking care of everything in the universe, so I'm part of that universe, I'm in good hands, right? In a metaphorical way. Wallah Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And don't forget His mercy, because it's in abundance. Rahmati Sadaqat Ghadabi. My mercy and compassion. It supersedes and outweighs my displeasure and retribution. Then, Maliki Yawm ad You're going to see it's interesting how the conclusion meets with the introduction. What does Maliki Yawm ad mean? Huh, Majid? It means sovereign of the day of judgment or king of the day of judgment. He can give you this lesson. <coughs> sovereign of the day of judgment, king, ruler, owner, the one who has absolute authority and control of the day in which we the human being and jinn will be accounted for how we chose to live, our intentions and actions. Bima kuntum ta'malun. Jaza'am bima kuntum ta'malun. You will be rewarded what you used to do. So he's that one. So to make it proper that you are in good shape, iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Only you do we worship and none other. And if I need anything, I know primarily I go to you. And then if I need to go to somebody else after that, I'm trusting that you will facilitate it through whichever means I'm going through. And I'm only going to do use means that are pleasing to you to get what I want. Right? Then it becomes the most important part of spirituality. The most important dua, the most important supplication is, إِهْدِنَا الصُّرَاطَ mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. Right? This means, what is the exact way? Put me in the mainstream. Give me the clear-cut, undoubtable way, right? Guide us to the straight path. The straight path. There's no curves and crooked. There's no doubt about it. Surat al-ladhina an'amta alayh. The path that you have blessed those who are on it. I want to be in your contentment and blessing. Ghayr. Ghayr al-maghdubi. Not those who you're displeased with because of their own actions. Maghdub, the one who did it themselves. They caused it. Allah is not misleading or upset with anybody except for something they have done. He is Rahman, originally. Right? He's only accountable for their chosen deviation. Waladali, and not of those who are astray. Right? You have a narration that most scholars said authentic that related it to Jews and Christians. And the anti-Islam movement, they love this one. Because they say, see, 
Islam from the very get-go and the beginning is teaching that Jews and Christians are misguided and no good. And so why do you want these people in your country? Right? No. In our scripture, and oh, you know what I respond when they say that? I say, look, for a Christian, they have rejected Jesus Christ. According to most Christians, are they going to go to heaven? Huh? The Jews have said, we don't accept Jesus as anything but a liar, a deviated prophet. That's their opinion. That's what they say. Does that make them say, now we don't support Israel? So you can make a relationship with somebody that you disagree with, isn't it? They've shown that. They've proven it clear as day. There's no doubt about it, right? That you can make a, a, a different type of relationship with someone you disagree with in theology. What it's saying is, I don't want to become of those who have earned the anger and displeasure of Allah because of being misguided. Meaning what? Choosing misguidance. Because Dalin is not choosing misguidance, it's not knowing guidance. So when we say, okay, this one, the hadith says this one is similar to the Jewish nation, and this one is similar to, it's not talking about all of them, because we know many of them, you know, became true, pure believers, better than any of us here, the Abdullah bin Salam and others, right? So what it's talking about is people from within, like we would say, those that rejected from the rabbis, Jesus Christ, those people knew good and well he was the Messiah. They knew it. And they rejected it because they didn't like him criticizing them. They wanted to stay the elite. And he's saying, no, the way you're functioning, the way you're acting, is a deviation from the original way of God's blessing to the Israelite people. So those people have chosen a deviation, right? Maghdubi alayhi. Dalin are people who love God. So you're good Christians, they're very sincere people. Very good-hearted people. جَعْنَا فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ رَأْفَةً وَرَحْمَةً It's in the Qur'an. They're very merciful, compassionate people, sacrificing their interests for others. <coughs> but as far as theology, creed, they have some very interesting things that historically, if you look where they came from, they don't even know where they came from, but they're just following them because that's what they were told to believe, right? So that's what it's talking about. And it's not dooming all of them. Allah's going to judge people on the Day of Judgment who is, you know... Uh, people of faith and who is not, who has true monotheism in their heart. That's not our business. We don't make that judgment. So, once you've made that prayer, as we read in Salah, You want to know the straight path? You're looking for the straight path. Here's your answer. Right? Here's your answer. This is the book. There's no doubt about it. A straight path. In it will be guidance for those people who are spiritually conscious. What are their qualities? The first thing they are very certain about is that they humble themselves knowing, I don't know everything. So there are things in the unseen, <coughs> unperceived world that I can't hear or see or feel or touch that exist and they are there and I don't know. And so whatever Allah tells me about that, I know about it. Other than that, I have no other way to know. And I leave it to Allah to tell me. Or if scientists figure it out, like historically, they didn't know what a virus or a bacteria was. Now we know about it. It was unseen. For a long time, you would have described that to somebody that said you're crazy, right? So the unseen world, we're figuring out about it all the time. Then the next step, they established regular prayers. Every day they pray, five times a day, they're devoted to their prayers. They, from the wealth they've been given, they give. They give it to everyone. Whoever they can give to, they give it. They believe in revelation. What was revealed to all prophets, and they believe what was revealed to this prophet. Right? Those are the people of success. Those are the people who are on the guidance of their Lord. So now we know exactly what Surah An-Nas is talking about. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Right? Say, I seek protection. I seek refuge, safety, with, by the means of, the Lord of all of the people. Rabb is referring to He's the Creator, He's the Provider, He's the Maintainer, He's the Sustainer. Rabb, it's kind of like fathership, as we said. But we don't say Father because some people took God as like a human-like entity, which is blasphemy. So the beginning of this surah is telling us, look, all that what's in the Qur'an, you need to connect yourself regularly. Choose your Lord. What, how do you connect yourself to your Lord? Number one, 
you have to establish a regular relationship of prayer. This is the people who are getting their prayer answered. So here's one way to know if you are on the straight path or not, is that you have regular prayer. What's another way to be close to Him? Okay. Hmm? Okay. Before that, Zikr, Zikr, to remember Him in your daily interactions. But before that, even before both of those, reading the Quran, huh? reading, understanding, going deep into the Quran, the whole Quran is the answer to guide us to the straight path. It begins to explain to you what is the guidance. Right? So reading the Quran, understanding the Sunnah, is the protection of the Lord of mankind because He is the one that revealed this as the system by which you will be protected from evil. Right? So it's like when people say, just say, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ and then Allah will protect you. Wallahu a'lam, many scholars said it has a mystical power like that. For me, I think, it's a process of understanding and practice in, in understanding this surah, how you interact with it, how it affects your general daily life and attitude, which is going to protect you from shaitan, right? So it's not necessarily just mystically. Somebody who doesn't pray, somebody who lies and cheats and fornicates and does all that, and then they say, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْحَيُّ الْقَيُّمُ And now I'm protected from shaitan. La shaitan is running through your veins and you are functioning as a representative agent of him. Right? Just saying that isn't saving you from anything. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's a holistic methodology that it's concluding the Qur'an with. Right? So the first thing is, you realize he is the one that has... The, because Rabb, what does Rabb do? He makes sure that there is an environment for you to live, to stay alive. A house over your head. Food in your stomach. Right? Rabb al bay They call this the father. Right? He makes sure that you're educated, <clears throat> that you have clothes on your back, that you have means of transportation. Everything you need to be well, here in this one is talking about the spiritual protection. Right? Here's the Rabbin Nas. Malikin Nas. Right? Malik is the king. This is the one who has full authority. Like some people say, oh, black magic and evil eyes doing everything and all of that. And he said, read the Ruqya Sharia. And that's great. MashaAllah, the Prophet taught it. But at the end of the day, should you be worrying and bringing these seemingly uh, mythological claims about black magic? And uh, how about you just say, مَا لَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا هُوَ مَوْلَانَا وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Right? Why don't we just say it like that? It doesn't matter where it came from. If it's bad, I'm content with whatever Allah has willed and it's, there is good in it for me as a believer. Right? So know that He is the King. He's in control. He's the ruler. He has absolute authority over everything and everyone. He makes the decisions, right? So what is this? Maliki Omidin, right? Malikin Nas, right? So as long as we, and because actually the more common recitation of Surah Al Fatiha is Maliki Omidin, right? So this is the nine from the Ashra, Qiraat Al Ashr. The nine of them is Maliki Omidin. It's only Hafsan Asr said Maliki Omidin, right? So it's very well established. This is what it's talking about. The, the introduction is correlating with the conclusion of the book here, right? You realize that everything that matters is in which day? Today, oh, do I have enough money? It, do I have perfect health? Uh, do I have a, a car that works? Is, is that what's most important? Is that what's most important? What's the most important day? The day of judgment. That's the most important day. So as long as every day, no matter what circumstances I have, I am with the king of all, particularly that day, I'm in good shape. I don't have to worry about anything, right? Because this life, it will be limited. We're all going to die today, tomorrow, 20, 30, 50, 60 years from now. We don't know it's going to happen. At that time, if we were so worried about worldly materialistic interests, and that's why we're so frustrated and all of this and this and that, some depression and sadness and anxiety, then this means you really didn't understand life. Right? So we have to be connected to Maliki and Nas. He is the king and the ruler of all people, me and all of us. Ilahin Nas. What does that mean? Oh. Hmm? The God of the people. The God of the people. So in Arabic, when you have something called Al Mudafa, there's called something called Idafa. Sigatul Idafa. Al Mudafa, Al Mudaf Ilay. Right? In Arabic, 
you cannot put ta'rif on the first one. You cannot put definitive on the first one. If you said Allah and Nas, it would sound very strange, right? A lot of people don't know what Allah means. They think it's just like some proper name for God. It has a meaning. It means the worshipped entity. That's the literal al-ma'bud. That's what the literal linguistic meaning of the word. It's an ancient Arabic word. They had it before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Every language has one. We have capital G-O-D. The French has Dios. Uh, all of these languages have their different expressions of the absolute truth, the divine entity. Ilah nas Meaning what? We should worship another. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Right? If you look, the introduction and conclusion are mirroring each other, step by step. Only you do we worship. We who? The believers. Well, and from only you do we seek assistance. Because why? You are the one that we worship and we're devoted to you. So you are ilah nas You are my creator and Lord and God, and you are the God and Lord and creator of everyone else. Right? So I am not devoting myself to any other than you. Right? If you do that, you've set the stage for a proper relationship. Right? But then he says, Min al waswas al khannas. So now we talked in three different phases three different phases. I seek refuge with the Lord of mankind, the King of mankind, the God, the worshipped entity, the true worshipped entity of mankind. From what? Min sharr al waswas al khannas. What we're being taught here, if you understand rububiyatullah and uh, mulkullah and uluhiyatullah, if you understand all of these, you know, divine qualities of God, it will help protect you, understanding them. That's when it says, Lillahi tis'un wa tis'un isman man ahsaha dakhil al jannah. God has these very special qualities or titles. There are 99 among them that if you knew them and you grasped them and you lived by them, not just you memorized them. Because once again, you got your guy. Doesn't pray, fornication, murdering people. Yeah, he's memorized the 99 names of Allah. Now is that going to put him in Jannah? No. <laughs> that is not gonna... What if some non-Muslim, he memorized the 99 names, that goes and puts him in Jannah? La. It's talking about someone who has an attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person who's very deeply attached to who he is in their daily life, they will be protected from evil. From shab, the evil or the badness. Al waswas. What does waswas mean? The whispers. Usually somebody wants to make a whisper a personal discussion. They don't want everybody to know about it. Right? Something that's a secret, right? Giving you ideas between you and them, right? And in many cases, they say, keep this secret for me, right? They whisper to you, say, don't tell anybody, right? But with shaitan, he wants you to become whatever he whispers to you. <clears throat> and he'll give you the idea like you're just pondering over it. But he's actually going to your depth, which is what we call sadr al-insan. Anybody can hear the ideas of Satan. But a true believing heart and mind will work together to A'udhu Billahi min shaytan al-rajim Qul A'udhu Allahu la ilaha Somebody will reject that with the remembrance of God and it will go away like that. But when you start to ponder over it and think it because you're having this private now discussion with him in your mind then it will go through your mind and into where? It will go into your heart. And it will become the way you think and the way you function. Right? That's his goal. He's really wanting that. So when it says, from the evil of waswas al khannas, it means what? He's always trying to give you ideas, and he keeps go. He keep, he's persistent. He's subtle and persistent. He comes and he goes. Right? So our scholar said, ihdin al-sarat al-mustaqim is the opposite of this one. Because how easy will it be for whenever some people's brother was asking, inna kayda shaytani kana da'ifa, right? The plot of shaitan, shaitan is weak. This is for the strong believer who is very strong in their prayer, and their remembrance, and their knowledge and understanding of the revelation. And when they deal with circumstances, always the overarching influence is Rabbil Alameen, Maliki Yawm al 
Allah Rabbil Alameen. This is the one that is influencing us. So when we start to think about um, getting angry and attacking someone verbally or something and getting upset, we have to start to astaghfirullah. We have to remember and seek his forgiveness and get away from that. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. Try to fix that thing. If we start to think about a female or a male, depending on which one you are, that is not our wife or our husband, and we're starting to look into that relationship, we say, A'udhu billah. The believer is always going to be protecting himself. Through what? Through revelation. Right? That's the protection. You see what I'm saying? That's what the protection It's not this superficial, say the, the, say the Muawiyah the ten. And then it will just immediately save your whole life from all of evil, right? It's a lifestyle. It's the way you live, generally, that is following Surah An-Nas. And the only way you can properly follow Surah An-Nas is if you know the rest of the Qur'an. If you're someone who's saying, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And you don't even know much of the rest of the Qur'an, you're not going to get much help. <laughs> because, إِهْدِنَا الصَّلَاةُ مُسْتَقِيمُ was the introduction. It told you, you need to read this whole book. Because it said, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ اللَّهُ رَيْبَ فِي هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And then Shaytan, he told, what is the main trick of Shaytan? You know what it is? Go back to the story of Adam and Eve. What did he do? He promised you. Yeah. زَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُ He says to them, oh, you're going to be, and this will make you, and yet, and people will think, and you will have, right? He, it's called ghuru, it's a trick. He gives you these ideas that materialistic, self-serving purpose is who you need to be. It needs to be about you. You need to have as much money, have as much enjoyment, and much entertainment, and that's the focus of your life, right? As so you get some people, they get into drugs because of this. Oh, that's fun. And then they realize drugs ruin your life, and it messes your mind up, and then you go to jail, and all kind of bad stuff happens, right? Because that's not how it's a trick. It's one of the tricks. Some people say, oh, she's just my co-worker friend. So if I give her a little hug here and there, it's not a big deal. And then he finds himself thinking about that hug. It was very... And it's just human nature. The reason why we have this law is to protect us from that stuff. That is the protection from shaitan through the Islam, from the Quran. When you say, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ You're talking about a whole lifestyle, not just reciting some Quran. The recitation to remember of you the, all that you've been reading before. It's the conclusion. The assumption of one who reads Surah An-Nas is that they've read the rest of the Quran and understand it and live by it. Right? That's why it's the conclusion. Yet, what's the most famous way we teach Quran? From the back. From the back. And it's made the way it's made, but who put it in the order that it's in? Allah. He's the guy. He's Ilah nas Malik nas He's our Rabb. How come we change the way the Qur'an is made up? It's a trick. Some people say, well, it's easier for kids to memorize. Why are we focusing on memorizing without explaining its meanings? And you know what I'm saying? We got our whole thing mixed up, right? The Qur'an is meaningless without a meaning. The Qur'an, literally, is true. If you don't understand the Qur'an, you just recite it. Of course, many ulama are going to say, well, we have a hadith that said you're going to get 10 hasanat for every letter you read. But is that because of the influence of the guidance that changes who you are and how you act? Or is it just mystical hasanat? What is the purpose of it? It's a book of guidance. Or is it a book of mystical barakah? What did it say about itself? Right? It says, Shifa'ul lima fi sudur. Someone said, we're going to have this hospital people pay money and when they're sick, we're going to read Quran on it. And the vast majority of those people go away and they're not healed. What is this? This is not what the book was meant for, right? It's a book of guidance. It's a book. You read it, you learn about Allah. His words touch your heart, you change your lifestyle, your environment, and then you're protected from shaitan. His whispers will have no effect or very little effect upon you. Can you please stop that? His whispers will have... This is a good whisper. His, his whispers will have very little effect on you if you're constantly focused on guidance. It's like somebody, I'll probably do it, I have a khutbah on entertainment in Islam, right? Because some people burn, I met this guy in Kuwait, 
we, uh, he sat next to me. I was getting my uh, my papers together for my iqama, my residency, or whatever about the green card license. And he's like, yeah, I'm here taking care of some of my employees. He said, mashallah. He did like that, mashallah. And I thought, oh, this guy is going to judge me by my beard. <laughs> and sure enough, he said, I used to be like you. And I said, how do you know anything about me? He was like, no, no, you're wearing the beard. And I was like, okay, and so what? You know, I'm following the basic, simple outward sunnah of the Prophet. He's like, I used to do that, but no, I did. I said, so even if you didn't have a beard, you can't still be a very good Muslim? He's like, you know what I mean. I was like, okay. I'm trying to understand the guy. And uh, he said, you know, there was a time when I was just everything, sunnah, hadith, all the uh, muhadarat and everything every day and all of that, and nothing, everything's haram, and music's haram, and everything's haram. And, and, but then, man, I just got, you know, it seemed like, subhanAllah, you know, life was, I just, you know, I couldn't do it anymore. Because he went to extreme. That's why the Prophet said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي The Prophet said, some guys came up, some young men, they said, look, I'm holy, pious, I'm following your message, He said, okay, explain to me what's your thing. I'm not going to marry. The Prophet said, what? He said, yeah, I'm not going to marry. The other one said, I'm going to fast every day. The other guy said, I'm staying up all night, every night, praying the Qiyam Lay. The Prophet said, hold on, let's back up a moment here. I'm the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've been given this guidance. I marry, I have wives, I have a relationship with them that I enjoy. And I have nights that I pray all night. I have nights I don't even pray the whole night. I just get up for fajr. And there are uh, days that I fast, and there are whole weeks that I didn't fast, as Aisha radiallahu anha narrated. So whoever would differ with my path is not from me. And there are many other examples. Prophet was on laughing, encouraging Aisha to entertainment and things like this. So there should always be a time for relaxation. The question is, how do you relax? Like, like when it gets to the whole issue about music, some people think it is just there's only one opinion, and those people are not very learned in the history of Islamic law. But the question is, if you were to listen to music, which guess what? All the kids listen to music, for those of you religious people who are very strict about this, it's fine for you to be strict, but guess what? They're all listening to music. So do you think it's better to take with an opinion that's going to give them moral music, nasheed type music to listen to, even if there is some instruments in there, or do we just say, it's all haram, right? Which one do you think is going to make shaitan take advantage of them better? I know for a fact the answer to this one. When you say everything you're doing is haram, they give up. The religion is impractical. It doesn't deal with reality. So then they're listening to this filth that is the mainstream music of nowadays. That is for sure haram. Lady Gaga, Miley Cyrus, this kind of stuff. Little Wayne, all these things they're listening to. It's filth. But there are many people who sing that is enjoyable. You get attached to it. And they are talking about moral things. We have someone, one of them is from, from Oklahoma, Kareem Salama. You ever heard of him? You ever heard of Kareem Salama? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's a country singer. And he talks about Islamic values. But he uses, a, you know, guitar and things like that. I'm not here telling everyone who is, mashallah, comfortable in their spirituality, staying away from music, that you need to do this and it's good for you and that's what you should do. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying for the one who's struggling with shaitan, which one do we do? The very strict thing that's very difficult for you to grasp, that will make things so an uphill, seemingly unsurmountable reality, or give you an opinion that is a respected opinion amongst many great mujtahideen from Ahl Sunnah, <laughs> not just Qaradawi or Ibn Hazm, as the movement that's trying to invalidate this opinion is being very unfair. Imam Shokani wrote a whole entire uh, book uh, rejecting the claim of ijma' on mutlaq as samaa So, these are just examples about how do we deal with shaitan. Like some people might say, you just got to live a life all time dhikr. Shaitan will use that against you, burn you out, and then you stop pra praying altogether. Right? Some people have this idea about religiosity that gives shaitan fuel. Some people start arguing religion. A brother came up to me and said, I'm trying to argue with my neighbor about, you know, this thing. And I'm saying, 
Maybe you might not touch on the most sacred thing to him and say it's wrong. <laughs> Maybe you might stay away from that one. Don't, easy, relax, man, take it step at a time. Build a very strong bridge and then suggest things to think about. Don't question the truth of somebody that is not ready for that. It's a very delicate process, spirituality. If you look at Mecca to Medina and the growth process of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands this point. Some religious people, they want to own the truth. And then they start to use their religiosity in ways that alienates people. I've met many people that, you know, say, I don't want to go to the mosque. Why? Because those people over there, they judge people in this and that and the other. Or they start questioning what I do in this and that and the other. Or how I look or whatever. So, he is going to find one way or another. It requires comprehensive devotion to scripture to fight him off. You can't just say, I know an ayah, so that's haram, I'm going to tell everybody it's haram. Who are you? Be careful before you throw around an ayah and you don't even know what you're talking about. Right? That's part of understanding how to defeat shaitan, is knowing what to say at what time, with what person and situation. So, it's understanding his methods, how there are many methods. He has many different methods. So we need to come to know shaitan, and the Qur'an has so much about shaitan and his influence. من شر الوسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس He's trying to go down into your core. To That's why the, whenever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Atikaf, he's sitting there in Atikaf, and then Safiya, his wife, comes over. She said, I need to talk with you. So they go talking. So two of the Sahaba, they look at the Prophet ﷺ and they're staring. And the Prophet ﷺ told them, Relax guys, this is Sophia bint Huyi, this is my wife. And they said, Subhanallah ya Rasulullah. We're not saying anything. They said, No. I was concerned shaitan has been giving you an idea. And trust me, shaitan runs through human beings like the blood in their veins. Right? He's not, are they possessed by jinns? Or demons? No, they're an etikaf. These are devout Muslims. He's talking about even religious people. Even religious people can get the wrong idea. So I, went, I got sick the other day, the other time I went out of town, and some brothers started, where's the imam? What is this? The imam doesn't come to this new American imam thing. He didn't even come to salah now. <laughs> yeah. So then I told the brother, how about you explain to them where I'm at? We should come to a point where we have good suspicions and assumptions about each other. Even those that are not imam. But imams are human beings too, like you. We're still all struggling with spirituality. It's human reality. I've dealt with many scholars, and alhamdulillah, they're all Bani Adam. Alhamdulillah, no, no malaika here. We didn't meet them yet. So, so he's trying to get to the core. If we know what's in our core, and we keep it pure, by filtering out what comes through our mind, we're in great shape. Right? But if... We are willing to, like some one brother asked me, he said, um, is it haram if I looked at a woman? I said, if the woman walked by or you opened up Yahoo or something and then you looked over there, but then you looked away stuff for Allah, actually the Prophet himself said, that's normal. Don't look back. Don't take a double take on that one. <coughs> don't do that one. And don't click on stuff and don't go following her. The, the normal stuff, it goes away with shaking hands, making wudu, going to the mosque, reading some Qur'an. All that goes, just goes away, looking at a woman in some way. Like one brother said, well, if we have women and go back to the sunnah of the Prophet, somebody will look at them. Because we're always looking at them. As long as some brother doesn't go over there and start to touch her or some strange thing, which to my knowledge is not going to happen, even outside, much less in here in the mosque. So... Uh, this is what's from shaitan. To pursue intentionally. Like you think, like somebody's struggling with smoking. Say, well, I, ubtulit. I hate this way of talking. Ubtulit. It's like they, they're not in control of themselves. Right? I've heard scholars say, well, I ubtulia hadab tadkhin. La, huwa ikhtar tadkhin. He chose that. He that says he chose to smoke. The way you get rid of it is you take a position against it. You don't allow it in your presence. You don't hang out with people who smoke. You don't buy cigarettes. You don't. But once you say, take out the money and you start to pay for cigarettes, now you're a sinner. 
Other than thinking about it, it's normal. Everybody thinks about sin. Every last one of us thought about it, right? It's a famous in Tubudu Mafi and Kuzikum Tukhuru Yahasimukum Bihillah. Some people said, as we talked about last week, they thought, oh, this is maybe abrogated. It's not abrogated. What it is, is there's a difference between tafakkur uh, basit and azima alay. One is just, it thought about, oh, astaghfirullah, I wouldn't do that, right? The other one is thinking, thinking, making plans, doing things, plotting to do it. That is sinner. That's one who's not protecting from shaitan. They're not taking the guidance of the Quran, they're choosing. They're choosing a calculated step-by-step -step process to indulge in sin. That person is the one that is not getting the point of the Qur'an and the point of its conclusion to be protected from shaitan. Because they are allowing something to get to the core of who they are. Because it's when it goes to your core that you really start to be following it and, and pursuing it. Before that, it just goes through your head, you don't stuff for Allah. I wouldn't do that. I'm not going to do that. Right? Min al jinnati nas. So, shaitan can be a jinn, as it says, Kullu ibn Adam wukila ilayhi qareem. That there is a person, an entity from the jinn that is trying to mislead you. And so then Aisha said, What about you? He said, حَتَّى أَنَا لَكِنَّ اللَّهَ عَانَهِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَسْلَمُ Prophet ﷺ said, I gave him da'wah and Allah guided him to Islam. فَلَا يَأْمُرُنِي إِلَّا بِخَيْرِ He only tells me to do things, it's a good thing. Because there are jinns that are Muslim and there are jinn who are not Muslim, just like human beings. But the human being, shaitan, is the worst. So somebody said, how do you know if it's from waswas is shaitan or from your own thoughts? Either way, if it's from shaitan, it's from shaitan. It makes no difference if you're the one who allowed it to become part of your thought process, which means it's getting into the core of you, or if there was an actual jinn whisper. Who cares about that? Let's not pay attention to that. Let's pay attention to the values <coughs> on what we're thinking about and pondering. Right? Like in Ramadan. Well, the hadith said what? The shayateen what? Sufidat. What does that mean? They're chained up. Yet, you will see in Ramadan many people that are shayateen. In your own home. Wallahi, it came to me. Family was fasting. The craziest thing, I was called to a hospital. This brother lost his mind five minutes before iftar. Got into an argument with his mother-in-law and his wife and all that. Ended up grabbing her, trying to choke her out. He's fasting. He's been fasting all day. I don't know if he knows what fasting is all about. He's been Muslim his whole life. He's like in his 40s. <laughs> so I have to go explain this thing. Do you realize you became shaitan, brother? He doesn't realize. He has no idea that he is actually shaitan himself. And that the human shaitan, dhikr, will not cause that person to just poof, go away. And if you yourself have taken on shaitan's thinking process, Dhikr is not good enough. You have to have knowledge and a huge toba process of repentance to get rid of that. It's a whole cleansing process. Just to say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allah, 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 A'udhu Billah. That's not going to solve your problem if you yourself are thinking like shaitan and functioning in his, in his, uh, in his understanding of what's life about. You have, to, you have to purify yourself. So that's basically what we're being told in the last part of the Qur'an we're being told make sure you pick your company well that's the whole conclusion to the Qur'an because if you choose people who are misguided as your close friends and influencers when it says it doesn't mean friends it means patron allies that you empower to influence you and to overtake your affairs and to be your like a, a guardian figure. It's like Walil al Mar'a. This is her guy. He's going to look into her affairs. He's going to influence the process of her life and these things, right? So, as Muslims, we need to make sure we pick who we choose to spend lots of time around. And that's where it becomes very important to make this place a place that at least a few times a week we're here and we're getting to know other people who are dedicated to this place. Because if you're called Muslim, and you have a name Muhammad or Abdullah or Fatim or Khadija, but yet you don't come to this place and you're surrounded 
Right, this goes back to the last surah. When the darkness surrounds you, and we are surrounded by darkness, the society we live in is not a morally deeply focused. It's a very well structured human rights and all that. There's many great Islamic things about the society that you will find in no Muslim country. But generally the idea of morality is just going down the drain for individual lifestyle. If you look at what's going on on television, on music and entertainment, I'll never forget when everybody thought it was normal that one of the most famous icons of music went to the Super Bowl and then took off her shirt in front of everyone. This happened like five, six years ago. And everybody acted like that was funny. Nobody was like, what in the heck is wrong with her? Isn't that a crime? Isn't that indecent exposure? Nobody would said that. Now you have laws being made in states and all kinds of things going on. That is why we have to be very careful to embrace Noah's Ark. What is Noah's Ark today? It's the mosque. It always has been. That's the place where we preserve ourselves. It doesn't mean we have to be in the mosque all the time. It means that we have to build relationships here and get projects to do, as we talk about in our sermons. Let's get together and form things in our life that are priorities. It's all about Allah and His, and His Rahmah, and being beacons of that, and working for that. If you do that, trust me, I'm the first to tell you, shaitan will have no influence on you. He will have very, very weak influence. Tayyip, any questions about shaitan and the last surah? Surely you have questions about shaitan.